Welcome to another episode of BHP Book Club. I am your host, Kelly Morgan. Today I'm sitting down and speaking with author Craig Svensson as we talk about his book, When There's No Cure, How to Thrive While Living with Pain and Suffering of a Chronic Illness. It's a wonderful nonfiction book showing people that are living with chronic illness and those around them how to still live a very full life. I'm excited that he's decided to be a member of the book club and share his book and his journey with us. Let's welcome our newest book club member, author Craig Swinson. Craig, thank you so much for being on the podcast and being a member of the book club. Welcome. Oh, it's a delight to be here, Kelly. Thanks. I'm so excited to talk about your book, When There's No Cure, because I, as I was just telling you, I think about that a lot in my personal life as you, as you get older and your health. Mm-hmm. And when you go to the doctor and there is nothing they can do for you. Right. I, I think that we all think that maybe the doctor is the, the end all, be all. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not. Right. You know, lots of people, there are millions of people that live with incurable ailments and the best we can do is help you live better. Right. And sometimes we can do things to reduce the symptoms. We might even be able to reduce progression. Sometimes we can't even do that. And sometimes there really isn't uh, any proven treatment out there. So there's lots of people living with incurable ailments. And the goal of my writing this book, um, the subtitle is how to thrive while living with the pain and suffering of chronic illness is to really try to help people navigate the difficult waters when their journey is going to include living with a chronic illness. So tell me what a chronic illness is. Sure. A chronic illness is basically an ailment that for the most part isn't going to go away. Now, a distinction for that would be chronic pain. Chronic pain, which um, afflicts a lot of people in, in America, Uh, Chronic pain is defined as having pain most days of the week for three months or more. So there are people who might have chronic pain that would last for years and then eventually it might go away. But they still would be designated for some period of time as chronic pain patients. Most chronic illnesses though, like high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, those things are never gonna go away. They, They will stay with you. It's estimated that in the United States, uh, about one in two adults will live with a chronic illness. And that's a lot of people. And as we get older, as we talked about earlier, when you get older, your your body's just gonna have areas where it just doesn't function like it used to. And most of us, if we live long enough, are gonna have to face at least a portion of our lives with chronic illness. Now, not all chronic illnesses result in suffering. For example, lots of people have high blood pressure and and they wouldn't say that their high blood pressure causes suffering. It it might be annoying to have to do the appointments, the lab tests and take the medications, but they wouldn't describe it as suffering. But people who live with arthritis every day, they live with constant pain, they experience a lot of suffering in their life. And and those are really the type of people that I have written this book for. Uh, People who have ailments that change the way they can do life. It might impair their ability to work. It might impair their ability to uh, carry out just leisure activities that they once enjoyed very much, or even everyday household activities that they would do. And so it's that population that I have particularly focused on in this book. So tell me about your background (laughs) and how you came to write this book. Sure. I'm a pharmacist scientist by training. So I'm trained as a health professional and also a scientist. My research for many years was focused on understanding adverse drug reactions and what causes people to have adverse drug reactions. But I've worked in a variety of types of clinics in my background in training and diabetes clinic, uh, primary care clinics, et cetera. And my own personal story though, weaves with chronic illness as well. I actually have three incurable ailments. I live with a rare form of colitis. I also developed chronic back pain. And then in 2007, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And so I've had to learn how to navigate 
those things. And I'll tell you, being a health professional is one thing, but being a patient opens your eyes to what those experiences are like. So I have been able to uh, learn both as a health professional that has in the past cared for patients. I haven't done that in many years. I've been focused on research and then uh, higher education administration, but also then as a patient navigating these things. I, I actually, um, interesting story, my daughter that recommended that I, I write on this topic. It wasn't what I had intended to do. In, in 2006, I came to Purdue University as Dean of the College of Pharmacy, Nursing and Health Sciences. And I knew at that time that I was only going to serve about 10 years. I think changes in leadership are healthy. So around year eight, I began thinking about, okay, wh what am I going to do as I step down and transition to the faculty? What am I going to do as my scholarship? I wasn't going to start up a laboratory again. And I decided I wanted to, to write nonfiction books. And so I spent some time learning how to do that. And I also began research uh, working on a book on the topic of addiction. <clears throat> and uh, when I told my daughter what I was doing, she said, oh, I, I thought you would write a book on living with chronic illness. You have lived with them and learned how to manage chronic illness. And uh, I thought maybe that's what you would do. So she set my mind thinking, you know, and I just chewed on it for a while. It was pretty easy to come up with an outline of what I might do. And um, so it was really at her suggestion that I kind of shifted directions and first started on this book then and moved in this direction. How, how can you think that one could manage a chronic illness with no insurance? Ah, uh, that is a challenge, isn't it? Well, fortunately in the United States, we, we do have a lot of um, safety net areas. It doesn't cover everybody, obviously, but many towns have health clinics that uh, pay on a, you have to pay on a sliding scale. The federal government uh, funds these, they're called federally qualified health centers. And for people who don't have insurance, they can go there and um, their ability to pay determines what they will pay. It, it can be difficult because obviously you still have to pay something. Um, and then getting all the other stuff. So for example, if you're diabetic, paying for the needles, you know, paying for the insulin. Sometimes you might need special inserts in your shoes. And there are resources that exist, but it is a, it is a challenge for people, particularly people who are in between that coverage where they're, they, they're not going to get covered by Medicaid. They're, they're not at that level of income, but they don't have insurance. Those are the people that really get squeezed. People who are employed, um, but they don't have employment that gives health insurance. Or they can't and, and afford it. Yes, right? if they're, yeah, right, if their job doesn't provide it. So it, this is an area, obviously, as you know, lots of uh, discussion at the national level of how do, how do we close that gap? Because those are the people that are really um, struggling the most. The people who are at a poverty level that they're covered by Medicaid, I'm not saying life is easy for them, but they have coverage. They have an insurance type of coverage. It's that next level people who are working a job, maybe they're working multiple part-time jobs, none of which are obviously because they're part-time gonna provide insurance. Those are the people who are struggling the most in our healthcare system right now. And I wonder about those people handling chronic illness. I know in my own experience, I don't have Crohn's, but my son was diagnosed with Crohn's. Mm -hmm. And as a teenager in high school, he's now out of high school and he's a young adult, but knowing that this disease will never go away, it's one thing to deal with the medication and the doctors and the appointments, but mentally, psychologically, does your book talk about that at all? How to deal with that? Because that's that that was huge for me and it wasn't even happening to me was happening right. to him i was yeah. just watching this thinking about all of these things it's like wow, how are you going to deal with this for the rest of your life that's really a major focus of my book because it really comes down to a heart issue because the, the difference between an acute illness and a chronic illness is an acute illness threatens your health but a chronic illness threatens yourself mm. you know when i'm acutely ill i something hurts i've got a pain but I know it's going to go away. I know that life's going to get back to normal. Maybe I have to take a couple of days off work. Maybe I'm hindered from the exercise I like to do, whatever. But life is going to return to normal. But when you are diagnosed with a chronic illness, life is never going to be normal again. Your life is perhaps even only going to get worse as your health deteriorates over time. And that's a tremendous weight on the soul. 
And so it's really recognizing that you need to think about those elements, not just your physical body, but realize how it impacts your life. It's going to impact your relationships. It's going to impact the things that are important to you in many different ways. And being intentional about that, realizing the depth, you know, how it's going to impact your family. So, for example, you were impacted by your son's illness. And it's important for people who live with a chronic illness, realize they don't bear that burden alone. Their loved ones also have their life changed now. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a spouse or a parent or a child, life is going to change for them too because of your illness. And we who live with chronic illnesses need to be sensitive to that fact and and realize that. In fact, I I was a little bit slow in realizing that. Uh, My first ailment that came on uh, shortly after my wife and I were married and I had a colitis that was really just out of control for many years. And and it took me many years to realize how much it was impacting my family. You know, I was so ill and feeling so poorly. I was just focused on getting through myself. And I wasn't as sensitive as I should have been of how it was impacting everybody else in the family. And when you think intentionally about the things that you do, it's you realize you can thrive in the midst of facing a chronic illness. You know, one of the most rewarding things about this book, um, shortly after it was published, I had a, a guy from another country actually send me an email. And he said, I had recently been diagnosed with an incurable ailment. And he said, I, I was living under a dark cloud and thought, how am I ever going to be able to enjoy life now? And he said, reading your book has shown me, yes, I can thrive even when living with chronic illness. I said to myself, okay, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to achieve is to help people. But it really becomes a matter of living intentionally and thinking carefully, evaluating, and good communication with the people that are important in your life because they will help you and you can help them walk that journey. I think it's also important. I I was just going to say, I think it's also important to realize and remember, you know, I might struggle with chronic illness, but but my my next-door neighbor may struggle with a parent that uh, doesn't recognize them anymore, has Alzheimer's, and they're they're bearing their own burden. And, and the person living on the other side of me might have a completely broken marriage, and they're, they're struggling. And it's important for those of us who live with the struggle of chronic illness to realize, you know, we're not alone in the struggle. People all around us are facing struggles. They're just maybe not physical, but they're still challenging their heart. Yeah, I think that the um, chronic illness not only, like you said, it takes a physical toll, but it also takes a, a mental toll. Yeah. And how you how you decide to cope mm-hmm. with that chronic illness. Right. And, you know, the others around you, how they decide to cope too. Um, right. and, and talking to my son, this is somebody who's probably going to be on Chimera for the rest mm-hmm. of his life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm like, and that's huge. It is. You know, and, and to, I still, I think about it and I just like, oh, I just, I never grew up having to take any medication, Mm. right? I was a pretty healthy kid. I never really thought about having a chronic illness until he had one. Yeah. And you can become, feel like you're tethered to something. In this case, a drug that you have to take all the time, right? Because now your life schedule revolves around when you have to go get that drug, et cetera. And I People never... on dialysis feel the same way, right? People who have dialysis, they're, okay, now my life is governed by when I have to go and get on dialysis and everything it get, becomes driven by my illness. And so yeah, unless you think about it intentionally, it can really overwhelm you. Do you talk about <laughs> not letting, not identifying as the illness? Do you know what yeah, I mean? Right? Getting that okay. label as somebody who has diabetes you know do you talk about that i do and not allowing the disease to define you yes that's what i'm trying to say it's it's something that you have but it doesn't have you unless you let it so it doesn't define you it's not your identity um and it's it's really important to recognize that that um when you are diagnosed with an illness It does change your life, but it doesn't have to govern your life. It may seem like it at times. And if you become trapped in it, it can. I think there's one of the challenges that many people face when they have a chronic illness is they can become so absorbed in trying to find a cure. 
And they're, they just mm. con- constantly are searching and running from one thing to another, looking for a cure. And one of the things I write about is there, there comes a point in time where you have to accept there is no cure. So you move the equation from how do I get rid of this illness to how do I thrive in the face of this illness? And, th- and that's a pivot point in most people's lives when they become diagnosed with a chronic ailment, where they, they come to recognize this is going to stay with me. I'm not going to get rid of it. So how am I going to manage it in a way that I, I can still enjoy a full life? And you can, even when you're living with a chronic illness. Do you have any idea through your research how many quote unquote incurable chronic illnesses there are, or at least common, I'm sure there's many, but commonly, like how many there are? Well, let's take an example of multiple sclerosis. There's uh, about a million people. Um, If you take fibromyalgia, uh, estimates are as high as five to 10 million people there. When you look at different types of arthritis, you're probably talking about tens of millions of people. It's estimated that about 10% of the population is living with what's called an invisible disability. That means a chronic disease that impairs their life in some way, but it's not visible to people around them. And so usually the biggest impairment tends to be pain of some sort or another. If you were to take all the people in America today that are living with chronic pain and you were to bring them into one geographic area, they would represent a population larger than the 10 largest cities in America combined. Wow. It's a huge number. 25 to 30 million people today are living with chronic pain. So we're talking about very large number of people. Does the book talk all about um, medication or self-medicating or anything yeah. like that? So some of the questions I, I uh, talk about is, how do you deal with making decisions about medication choices? Particularly, um, many people, when they have uh, an ailment for which there is no cure, they face the, the struggle of, should I try unconventional therapies? And so I give some guidance about how to think that through. How to think through whether you should try something. And if you decide to do that, how do you evaluate it? You know, what what people need to realize is there's really only three kinds of medical interventions. Medical interventions that have been proven to be effective and safe for the ailment you have. Medications or interventions that have been shown not to be safe or effective for what you have. Or medications or interventions where we don't really know. There's not enough data to tell us whether it works or doesn't. So you need to decide where something falls into the category. Obviously, if something's been shown to be safe and effective, that's where you're going to try first. Doesn't seem to make any sense trying things that we know don't work or we know aren't safe. Right. But it's what about that category of, well, you know, there's just not enough information out there. And people that have incurable ailments will often face those decisions. And the important thing is to realize that if you're going to go down that route, you have to ask, is there a reasonable basis to think this might help my ailment? And who is making that recommendation? Do they really have the qualifications to understand the disease and what they're recommending? And then if you decide to try it, to think carefully through, what am I actually trying to achieve? You know, what, what is it that I, I, I'm hoping this medication will do for me? And then make sure you have some objective way of telling whether it can or not. Maybe you need to keep a diary about your pain or if you're fighting fatigue, whatever it might be to try to decide. I, I had someone come and, and ask to consult with me and she brought me a bag of 15 different supplements and other things that she was taking, put them all on the table. And I said, well, what's this one for? And it was some kind of general thing that she said it was I said so how do you know if this is helping you and we could do that with all the bottles that she had she had no idea whether any of these were actually helping but she just kept adding more and more on and obviously taking them into her body and was spending a lot of money with all of these supplements and things like that without having any assessment of has it really made my life better has it really taken care of what impairs me most with my ailment 
And so I, I talk a little bit about that in the book about how you have to think through very carefully, whether you're talking about a prescription medication or a dietary supplement or whatever it might be, what is it you're trying to achieve? And how am I going to tell whether this is really helping me or not? Does alternate therapy and alternate medicine, uh, alternative medicine fall under that umbrella as well? Yes, absolutely. Even more so there because um, <clears throat> many of those things haven't been studied carefully. In fact, by definition, they basically haven't. There's also a safety issue that I talk about. Um, one of the challenges with what is often labeled as alternative medicines is, is they're not... Um, there's not regulated the same way as other medications are. For example, if you go and buy an aspirin, it doesn't matter whether you buy that aspirin in a pharmacy or grocery store or gas station, you can be quite confident it has 325 milligrams of aspirin if that's what's labeled because it's regulated very tightly by the Food and Drug Administration. On the other hand, dietary supplements are not. They don't come under the same regulations. They're not actually regulated at all by the Food and Drug Administration. So people have to be very thoughtful about how do I know what I'm taking actually has what the label says. Isn't it? And, that, and that's one of the challenges for people taking dietary supplements. It's not, there's more regulation around individually wrapped cheese than there are around double, dietary supplements. <laughs> so it's a concern. And if your health is already poor to begin with, you need to be particularly careful. And so I often recommend people keep a health diary, especially at times when they're gonna try some kind of intervention. Keep a health diary before and during to try to be able to objectively look at that diary then and say, has my health really improved or not? Yeah, it's it's a lot to take on, I think. But I think that uh, the, the things that you mentioned would help even when I look at my own, I'm somebody who suffers from chronic pain. I had back pain for years and went through all the, the steps that they tell you to go through. And my final resolution was surgery. Mm -hmm. Everything led up to surgery. And I was like, no, right? Well, and then yeah. they were like, well, basically you're, you're out of options. There's nothing mm -hmm. else to do. Mm -hmm. You're just gonna have to figure out what you're gonna do with your chronic pain. And I actually went to acupuncture, okay. which took it away. So okay. I don't, I'm not in pain anymore mm -hmm. all the time. Okay. You know, obviously if I bend or work my back too much, then yes, but it goes away. It's not constant like it used constant. to be, right? So to me, it's like, you really have to figure out what works for you. It doesn't right. work for everybody, right? but I had tried everything that mm -hmm. a physician had told me to try. So I did all the, mm -hmm. went to the pain and all the medication. And, and, and that's when I really started thinking to myself, what you were saying, is this really helping me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After a while, the answer was no. Yeah, and many times people are placed on prescription medications that simply, they're not working for them. Maybe yeah. they work for the average patient, but they don't work. And so even when you put on prescription medication, because so often people just have prescription medications piled on and piled on and piled on, just add it to one another, and then you start having problems with the medications. Um, and it's, it's understandable when uh, conventional medicine interventions don't help, it's perfectly understandable that people are gonna look to other alternatives. And many times what people find is that there's other life adjustments that make it the bigger impact for them. So for example, me with chronic pain, it was, uh, it's my back is where I live with chronic pain. I, I had to stop getting in a car. I just had to stop getting in and out of car. I had to get a elevated SUV so I don't sit down. That had the biggest impact on me more than any physical therapy or any other interventions I had. So sometimes it's those life adjustments that, you know, somebody like an occupational therapist actually might be the most helpful person for someone that lives with chronic pain to help them change their work environment, for example, or even their home environment, the things that will not aggravate that pain. And over time, then they find ways that they can do things that will minimize the amount of pain that they have in the long run. Yeah, very, very true. I think, yeah, and there's a lot of adjustments I had to make as somebody with, you know, there are just some things that I just cannot do anymore, you know, or if I sure. do them, I have to be incredibly careful, right? And patients have to learn to be comfortable doing that, to realize that 
that that when you have certain diseases, th there will be things that you need to walk away from. Uh, there may still be times you push it and do it. Um, I'm not going to not pick up my grandkids, even though it might end up provoking pain, right? I'm just not going to do that. I'll live with the pain and pick up the grandkids. Um, but it, but it's thinking about those life adjustments. And that is often hard for people because they're giving something up and other people may misunderstand them. They may think they're avoiding some kind of work that should be done or mm -hmm. et cetera. And, and those are hard things for patients to live with. In fact, it's one of the hardest things for them to deal with, the misunderstanding that they experience from other people. I have a whole chapter in my book that's devoted to that very issue. Because so many people, if you look at them, they look well, but the, the reality is they're fighting a tremendous amount of fatigue or pain or dizziness. But just to look at them, you would never know that. Right they, right. they have an invisible illness. Yeah, that is very, very true. Craig, tell me again, where is the book available? It's available uh, at Amazon, available at Barnes and Nobles, any of those normal places that you would purchase a book. Um, any plans to turn it into an audiobook? I haven't at this point in time. It is available both as a paperback and as an ebook. You know, I've looked into that a little bit about doing an audiobook uh, and just haven't gone that route yet. But um, I've had one or two people ask me about it. Yeah, I just I just think that you just yeah. open up yourself to a whole new yeah. audience. There's a lot of people out there who love to read, who just don't have time to right. pick up a book but they will mm -hmm. definitely listen to a book. Right. Yeah, so I always tell everybody, you know, if you don't have an audio book, I just think you're just, yeah. Especially those who just like to listen, right? Yeah. You know, yep. you just a whole nother, a whole nother quote unquote reading audience for you. Right. Yeah, that's true. Good okay. idea. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I truly enjoyed speaking with you. Tell me the name of the book one more time. When There Is No Cure, How to Thrive While Living with the Pain and Suffering of Chronic Illness. And it is available on Amazon. Thank you it so is. much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for listening to another episode of BHP Book Club. I have been your host, Kelly Morgan. I just wrapped up with Craig Swinson as we talked about his book, When There's No Cure, How to Thrive While Living with Pain and Suffering of a Chronic Illness. I thank him for coming on the podcast and being our newest book club member. You can get the book on Amazon or anywhere good books are sold. If you are an author and you would like to be on the podcast, it's really easy. Go to my website, brightheadedpublishing.com. Go to the contact section, fill out the form. I will reach out to you. We will connect and we will figure it out. And the end game is that you become the newest member of the book club and you come on the podcast and share your book with all of us. Thank you for listening. As I always say, there's a lot of podcasts out there. There really are. So I really thank you for spending your time with me and the author. Next week, I'll bring you another author, another journey, another story. But until then, keep writing. <laughs>